chapter is all about light and the way that light interacts with matter. First of all, what is light? Light is a type of electromagnetic radiation that consists of oscillating electrical and magnetic fields whose direction of travel is uh, perpendicular to the oscillation of the field uh, vectors. So all that is to say that it can uh, excite electron transi transitions, it can be used to convey energy, it can be used in the field of perception so we can see light, and it interacts with matter in a number of different ways. What we think of as visual light, so the visual range of the electromagnetic spectrum is actually a very uh, kind of tiny uh, bandwidth of the total electromagnetic spectrum that starts with cosmic uh, gamma rays, then x-rays, then UV rays, then visible rays, then IR, then microwave, then radio waves, and all of these types of electromagnetic radiation that have different that can be characterized by different energy um, or frequency or wavelength they all interact with nanoscale materials in different ways and some of those ways are listed right uh, right here Electromagnetic radiation consists of photons, and photon is a word from the particle type of description of light. So light waves, or sorry, so light has properties of both waves and particles. What happens when light strikes an object? And the answer is scattering absorption or nothing and we won't worry at the moment about what happens after the light uh, the light leaves in the case of absorption but let's just take these one at a time so scattering involves the uh, when a when a photon strikes a piece of matter it causes a transient polarization of the electron cloud, similar to kind of how London dispersion forces uh, work. So there's a transient polarization of the electron cloud, and then upon re-equilibration of that electron cloud back to its normal uh, position about the nucleus or nuclei, in the case of a molecule, a photon is re-emitted. And so that's scattering. And scattering can occur in a couple of different ways, one of which is completely elastic scattering, where there is no change in the energy of the molecule or the photon before and after scattering. It's a bit like a billiard ball bouncing against the, the sidewall of the billiards table or another ball in which there's no energy dissipation whatsoever. There's no, hypothetically, no friction, no sound upon collision, which is dissipated energy. It's just a pure bouncing phenomenon. Energy, same energy that goes in comes out, and that is uh, elastic scattering. There is inelastic scattering in which some energy is absorbed by the molecule particle or surface atom atom molecule particle or surface by the light and then the scattered light or reflected light has different properties than the uh, than the light that went in and this is sometimes called uh, raman scattering in which the incoming light excites a vibratory transition. So the a light wave comes in, and the next mole and the molecule that it hits was originally in the ground state, vibrational state, and then becomes very excited. And then the scattered photon has less energy because some of that energy went into exciting this vibration state. So that's a type of inelastic scattering. It's called a Stokes shift. And a Stokes shift is just jargon to mean that the light coming out had less energy than the light going in. Then there is anti-Stokes uh, scattering where the molecule or sur surface or particle or atom, the piece of matter that the photon comes in and strikes is originally at a higher vibrational energy state and then some of that energy was, trans was transferred to the photon that is scattered 
back into space. And as a result of that collision, the molecule atom particle surface, the matter is now in a lower energy vibrational state than what it started with. And that's an anti-Stokes shift or a blue shift because the photon that comes out has higher energy. So bluer, um, even though that actual difference is going to be tiny compared to the wavelength of energy that came in. Typically, Raman scattering is observed using a visible photon, um, but then the differences in energy from the light that goes into the light that's scattered out is in the infrared regime. So it's a much smaller fraction, so it's a very small fraction of that energy of, uh, of light. Let's talk a little bit about absorption. So absorption is when there is a photon that comes in whose energy is commensurate with an electronic transition from a lower state to a higher state. And what does that do or mean or how does that arise? Well, in the last video, we talked about the difference between the valence band and the conduction band in a semiconducting polymer. And that's also true. It happens in, uh, in a wide variety of materials. Some materials that absorb in the visible are molecular dyes like food coloring, lycopene, beta carotene, stuff that makes clothes colored, um, and quantum dots. It occurs in quantum dots, which are semiconductor nanocrystals. It also occurs in bulk semiconductors. So when a photon comes in and it excites an electron up from the ground state to some excited state, that if that energy uh, is matches the energy of a photon coming in, then that transition will happen. And that process is called excitation. And once that, uh, once that electron is up in the higher state, it can do a few different things. It, th through the, the result of collisions and so forth, it can kind of just sort of fall back down and, uh, and not do anything. That would be um, an example of uh, de-excitation, um, of a, of a non-emissive de-excitation. Another type of de-excitation would be if that molecule just went down with release of a photon to make to uh, assure continuity of uh, of or uh, conservation of energy, and that would be called fluorescence. There's another process similar to fluorescence that occurs when the spin of the electron flips. So in chemistry class, remember, we always drew one up arrow, one down arrow. Those up and down arrows were meant to convey the concept of spin. Spin is a way that two electrons can occupy the same orbital or the same band, in this case, without, uh, without having exactly the same quantum numbers. So that spin quantum number allows them to kind of coexist even though they electrostatically uh, repel from each other. So once you get this spin flip, then it's stuck there because it can't just recombine. So it finds this other what's called manifold of states uh, in a process called intersystem crossing. Don't worry about the details of that. Then that photon or that electron goes back down to the ground state where it emits a photon. And that, pho that process is called phosphorescence, and that can take a long time. Phosphorescence is what, uh, how the glow-in-the-dark stars in your bedroom ceiling <laughs> work, and they stay glowing for like half an hour after you turn the lights off, whereas fluorescence is a fast process. It's basically immediate by the human eye. And that process is responsible for if you put on a black light in, say again, your childhood bedroom and you have some like white clothes on and they glow, um, that's due to fluorescence in the materials in your clothing. And, uh, and what I mentioned before was non-radiative decay. That means that the, the, through a bunch of collisions and so forth, the electron just returns to the ground state without really doing anything useful. Another thing that can happen is that the two molecules can be close to each other. One can be excited and one can be not excited. And the excitation energy can actually transfer from one to another. That can either be due to 
emission and reabsorption, so re-emission by the first molecule into absorption by the second, or it can be due through uh, due to non-photon uh, near field, don't worry about that, type coupling that gives you the ability to for these excitations to kind of uh, kind of hop from one molecule, nanoparticle, piece of matter to another uh, region. There's a process that's implicit in, in much of this, and that's called thermalization. So once you get an electron absorbed from the conduction band or from the valence band to the conduction band, usually, unless you have exactly the right energy, you're going to overshoot the band edge of the, the conduction band. And then you'll get a process where the electron quickly moves down to the band edge. That process is called thermalization. It's actually a loss process when it happens in a solar cell. That thermalization process is, uh, is quick and there's really nothing you can do about it. But it also allows you to absorb a much broader range of wavelengths because you're able to get that electron into one of many, many, many specific bands above that band edge, which is advantageous, again, for things like, well, solar cells and dyeing clothes and so on. Now, how do we perceive these colors? So our eyes have cone cells, which sense color, and rod cells, which sense light and dark, basically. And the cone cells have dye molecules in them that correspond to a peak absorptions in the blue, green, and red parts of the uh, visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, because we only have three color receptors, we our brain kind of combines nerve impulses from those different cells in our retinas to our brain, which, um, which interpolates into a different color. So the only things we can really see are blue, or the only things that our eyes respond to are blue, green, and red, even though we can perceive tens of thousands of different colors. And the way that works is that when a photon comes in with a different wavelength or photons come in with multiple wavelengths, they excite all of these different cone cells to different degrees. And that leads to the perception, uh, which some mapping in the brain that gives us the perception of a color, even though it just is, is derived from a superposition of these three fundamental dyes in the cone cell. Now, what if just one wavelength comes in? Well, one wavelength, you could have a yellow wavelength of light come in. Now, is that wavelength really yellow? No, we just perceive it as yellow. So the yellow wavelength comes in and it and it excites a lot of the red cone, a little bit less of the green cone and none of the blue cone. And that's why you see yellow. All right, so there's a lot of stuff that can happen. This is a, uh, a flow chart of what happens when a photon comes in. You can get an electronic transition that leads to absorption. You can get the electron cloud to polarize which and, and re-emit when it returns to normal. That is scattering. It's different from an electron uh, electronic absorption to a different quantum mechanical orbital. This is just scattering involves just the electron comes in and shakes, or sorry, the photon comes in and shakes the electron cloud. That's all that means. Then you can have a mismatch in the energy of that's incoming versus the energy of some perspective electronic transition and if there's a mismatch you'll get nothing or if the uh, even just like quantum mechanical statistics you might just not have a strong enough absorber uh, to uh, to absorb the photon you can predict some of these properties using what's called the particle in a box model so this guy uh, Erwin Schrodinger in the early 1900s postulated that or uh, that the um, that fo that electrons occupied something called a wave function they lived in something called a wave function and the wave function describes where in space the electron is going to be and there is this model called the particle in a box model, which is useful to describe the behavior of atoms, 
dyes, quantum dots, semiconductors, lots of different things. And basically what it says is that there is a infinite potential well, which means that outside the well, you can't have a particle. And inside the well, where X goes from zero to L, where L is the length of the box, you have these different wave function shapes. And let's just say you plunk an electron in there. The electron is going to kind of like occupy. You could think of it as bouncing back and forth, but really it's not going to be bouncing anywhere. It's just going to be kind of resonating in there. And at the, the lowest possible level, that is where the wave function psi is, uh, is, is uh, at the lowest level, you have one of these humps that's like half a sine wave and that's called the ground state. You have one loop, no nodes. Then you excite into the, the first excited state or the second state from the bottom and you get a full sine wave and that's, uh, that's two loops, one node. The node is right in the middle. And then you have the second excited state or the third state overall. And in there you get two, uh, you get, um, two nodes, three loops, three loops, two nodes and that's like one and a half sine waves. Now that function psi of x is called the probability amplitude. If you square that function, it's called the probability uh, uh, density, and that's literally the probability of finding the electron at those places in the box. And it can be shown if you have a small enough box and a low enough energy particle that is a good match for the particle in a box model that say, let's say the first excited state, second state overall, that part where the psi squared goes down to zero, you actually have no probability of finding the electron there at all, which is pretty cool. Wave functions for the particle in a box generally have this form, the square root of two over L times sine of N pi X over L, where L is the length of the box. N is called the principal quantum number, uh, which also happens to correspond to the number of loops in the function. Pi is pi and X is just the position along the X axis. Now the energies that you get inside the box correspond to this useful equation E sub n, so that's the energy of at a particular uh, quantum number equals h squared n squared over 8 ml squared, where h squared is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules uh, per hertz, or joules second, but joules per hertz. It's a little bit more intuitive because it's the amount that the energy increases when you add another unit of per hertz to the frequency. Um, unit of hertz to the frequency, and uh, m is the mass of the particle, in this case the, uh, the mass of the electron. So in this chapter we, uh, we can think about the dye molecule beta carotene shown here, and you can model it as a particle in a box, and you can calculate the energy transitions between the different ends and you can predict when this material is going to absorb. And you can extend that kind of analysis to three-dimensional structures like quantum dots. It's not a completely straightforward uh, translation to three dimensions, but basically you see the same kinds of things where the bigger your particle is, the, uh, the narrower the band gap and the redder the fluorescence. That is where we will end uh, today. See you next time.